Western accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Well, hello there. Welcome to Brazier. Some fast-paced news from 4 until 6. In the next hour, there's a warning from the UK Health Security Agency that anyone who's at the highest risk of having caught the monkeypox virus ought to isolate for 21 days. The UK now has 21 confirmed cases. The virologist Professor George Lomonosoft will join me shortly to explain. Are we facing a new era of football hooliganism? Two football fans have been charged by police over an incident during a pitch invasion at the Etihad. Yesterday, after Man City lifted the Premier League trophy in some style, a sports lawyer will have his say. And as the Chancellor Rishi Sunak and his wife made the Sunday Times rich list this weekend, that's the subject of our debate. I'm asking, are our politicians, the richer ones at least, out of touch with everyday reality? According to the paper, the Chancellor is one of the UK's wealthiest 250 people. Does it matter? With me for the next two hours, the former Defence Secretary, Michael Portillo. But first, we have the latest news headlines for you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past four. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB Newsroom. A former Conservative MP has been sentenced to 18 months in prison for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Imran Ahmed Khan was expelled from the Conservative Party and resigned from the Commons after he was convicted last month. The 48-year-old carried out the attack in January 2008. The Prime Minister says he doesn't want to introduce new taxes to ease the cost of living crisis. But as pressure grows to introduce a windfall tax on oil and gas companies, Boris Johnson says no option is off the table. Speaking at a school in south-east London, he suggested more support will be offered to help households. I'm not attracted uh, intrinsically uh, to new taxes, but as I've said throughout, we've got to do what we can, and we will, to look after people through the aftershocks of, of COVID, uh, through the current uh, pressures on energy prices that we're seeing uh, post-COVID and with what's going on in, in Russia. But Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer says the Prime Minister isn't moving fast enough. I think there's a range of things that need to be looked at and uh, reinstating universal credit is one of them. There's all sorts of work that needs to be done on benefits as well. But the windfall tax is a simple solution which could be voted through Parliament very easily. Labour, it's Labour's plan. We'll vote for it if the government brings it forward. Um, but dithering and delaying is actually the thing that's stopping people getting that money to help them with their bills because £600 for those that need it most would make a huge, huge difference. Meanwhile, Downing Street has confirmed the meeting between Boris Johnson and Sue Gray while she was investigating lockdown rule breaches was first suggested by Number 10. Officials say they asked for a meeting to discuss the timings and publication process of her findings. Labour claims the meeting was an attempt to undermine the report. 
A health worker at Birmingham Children's Hospital has been arrested on suspicion of poisoning an infant with intent of endangering life. The 27-year-old woman has been suspended from her position while the police investigation is underway. West Midlands police say the child's family is being supported by specially trained officers. Contact tracing is underway following the first confirmed case of monkeypox in Scotland. At least 20 cases of the virus have been identified in England. The government has advised that people at high risk of catching monkeypox are to isolate for 21 days. The UK Health Security Agency says anyone who's had close physical contact with a confirmed case shouldn't travel and should avoid pregnant women, children and the immunosuppressed. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe says she was forced to sign a false confession before being allowed to leave Iran. Speaking to Emma Barnett on BBC's Women's Hour, the British Iranian national says it happened in front of a UK government witness and was filmed. Mrs Zaghari Ratcliffe says she expects Tehran to use it against her in future. I'm sure they will show that someday. Of you signing a confession? Of me signing it, even though it was under duress. And I just want to... And, um, to put it uh, here um, on the record, on the record that um, all the forced confessions that we have been exposed to, they have no value. They are just propaganda for the Iran Iranian regime to show how scary they are and they can do whatever they want to do. A review into children's services has warned thousands more will end up in care unless there's a radical reset of the system in England. The Independent Review of Children's Social Care says more than £2.5 billion of investment over the next four years is needed to prevent crisis intervention. The Education Secretary, Nadeem Sahari, says the approval process for foster carers is among the issues. Currently, we have about 80,000 foster care places of which about 20%, so 17,000, are not available for some reason, right? We have over 100,000 people inquiring about becoming uh, uh, foster carers, but very few actually uh, uh, complete and get through. I want to work with local government to see how uh, we improve that conversion. A Ukrainian court has sentenced a 21-year-old Russian soldier to life for killing an unarmed civilian. It's the first war crimes trial since the Russian invasion. The UN Refugee Agency says 6.5 million people have now fled the country. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. It's back to Colin. At six minutes past four, we're going to start with a story which has just broken in the last half an hour or thereabouts. It's the former Conservative MP, Imran Ahmad Khan, has been sentenced to 18 months in prison this afternoon after being found guilty of sexually assaulting a teenage boy in 2008. He was expelled from the party within hours of his conviction, uh, with moments of his conviction, I should say, and later resigned from Parliament, triggering a by-election in Wakefield in West Yorkshire. That will be held next month. Uh, let's turn to our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, who uh, is following this one. Uh, Tom, it's, it's a long stretch, 18 months. It certainly is, but it did look pretty certain that this would be a pretty substantial prison sentence, given what we know about how the trial went on through the previous months. Of course, Imran Ahmed Khan was convicted in April. He didn't. Uh, he was then kicked out of the Conservative Party. He didn't then resign uh, as an MP until the end of that month. There's a lot of speculation as to whether or not that's because he wanted to collect his full salary for that month. But yes, uh, now he is no longer an MP and facing an 18 month prison sentence. Uh, there's a, a lot to this case and clearly a lot that the jury found compelling. Uh, indeed, there was uh, the, the, the hint that a, a, a police report began to be filed back in 2008 but was taken no further at the time and then was taken back on in uh, 2019 when the victim heard that, his, uh, that the person who assaulted him had become a member of parliament. Then this had been uh, an investigation and then a court case dragging on for quite a few years before finally reaching 
this point. Uh, and the politics of this are very uh, poignant as well because his seat, Wakefield, uh, is a true red wall area. This is somewhere where the Conservatives won off the Labour Party that had held the seat for generations. It was only a very slim majority of around 3,000 or so. So whether or not the Conservatives will be able to hold this seat uh, on the 23rd of June when it's elected uh, in tandem with another seat in the South West, uh, well, it looks unlikely that the Conservatives will be able to hold that seat. It will certainly be an electoral test for how the party has seemed to be doing, as well as how the voters of Wakefield feel about their former MP. Tom, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Michael Portillo, former Defence Secretary, alongside me. I'm delighted to say again today, Michael, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, really interesting piece, double page spread, in fact, at the weekend in The Telegraph, wondering whether the Tories were heading for a meltdown akin to that scene in 1997. And, of course, the preamble to that was very much Tory sleaze, in quotes, Tory sleaze, sexual misdemeanours by MPs. Without getting into the specifics of, of this particular case, some people feel history is sort of repeating itself. Well, I would say no for, uh, for two reasons. One is I think that the so-called Tory sleaze of 1997, the allegations were vastly overdone. There was a lot of uh, rumour stuff going around at the time. We didn't, we didn't have the disbenefit of social media in those days, but we had very sleazy magazines that were churning out stuff, and quite a lot of it was absolutely untrue. And I would suggest the same caution today. For instance, uh, a Tory MP was arrested uh, recently, but that Tory MP has not been charged. Uh, and, you know, there are people saying, why don't we kick these people out of Parliament? What? Kick people out because they've been arrested before they've been charged, let alone put on trial. And I do think that um, members of Parliament are entitled to the same rights as the rest of the population. That is, you're innocent until you're proven uh, guilty. Um, and there is an instance. I mean, there is a, a deputy speaker today who went through the whole trial business and was found to be not guilty at the end. And he'll be very grateful to those friends who stuck with him during that period. And his name has been cleared and he serves as a deputy speaker today. And so I do say to people, you know, I, I caution you to wait for trials. Now, in this case, uh, a, a, a man who was a Member of Parliament who had committed a crime actually long before he became a Member of Parliament yeah. uh, has been found guilty of that. And the one thing I don't do is share your astonishment at the length of the sentence because a young person was... Actually, no, Michael, this. even as I read it, I thought, uh, no. Young, it's person, not a it's young person was involved in yeah. this. So I think a stiff sentence was uh, inevitable and appropriate. I'll mentor that. Totally agree. I, I said the wrong thing. Michael, thanks very much indeed. Now, the UK Health Security Agency is advising that contacts of those diagnosed with monkeypox should self-isolate for 21 days. The warning comes as the UK reached 21 confirmed cases of the virus, with the first case detected uh, in Scotland today. Contacts are advised to provide their details for contact tracing, stay clear of travel and avoid contact with immunosuppressed people, pregnant women and children under the age of 12. More than 80 people have also been identified with the virus across Europe, the US, Canada, Israel and Australia. We're joined by the virologist at the John Innes Centre, Professor George Lomonosov. Uh, Professor, thanks so much for your time. We do appreciate it. We are, I suppose, we have a kind of new sensibility. We're slightly attuned to viruses in a way that wasn't true hitherto, certainly wasn't true three years ago. Uh, but actually, when we look at this particular virus, about which we know a great deal, and which we already have the smallpox, smallpox virus, which, which we're told is about 85% effective against monkeypox. Yes, I mean, it's a well-known group of viruses. Um, a lot of them infect various animals, including humans. And of course, I think everyone's heard of smallpox. I mean, that was the virus which was a, a massive scourge for many hundreds of years until the effective vaccines were developed. Actually, the first ever vaccine to be so called back in the late uh, 18th century by Edward Jenner. Um, and the virus itself, monkeypox, um, doesn't appear to be that serious a disease. I mean, like any viral infection, you don't want to have it, uh, especially if you're vulnerable, um, such as immunosuppressed or um, anyone who, women who are pregnant. I mean, there's, there's always a, a fear about some kind of unknown effect. Um, but actually, it's not that transmissible. It needs close contact, unlike the one we're always going to compare it with, 
in recent years, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID. That is a respiratory virus which is transmitted very effectively just through breathing in the same air. Um, but this kind of um, virus you won't catch just by say, by say, for instance, sharing a, the sh same train compartment. That's much closer contact um, between individuals. And whatever the transmissibility, I mean, the government you'd expect, whatever the virus, uh, to, to, to take certain steps, and we're told they've got around about 20,000 do extra doses of the smallpox vaccine. So that's, that's good to go. That's good to go. I mean, it's an interesting situation in that uh, smallpox was officially eradicated in 1980, and so we don't routinely vaccinate against it anymore. Um, but we have, you know, made modern recombinant vaccines in case there are outbreaks of either smallpox somehow surviving in the environment. Fortunately, that doesn't seem to have happened, or indeed these related viruses. Um, and, uh, and so we are sort of ready to go if necessary. At the moment, I don't think there's any plans for a sort of mass vaccination campaign. Um, it's mainly contact tracing at the moment and, and trying to sort of limit the spread of the virus, which should be possible given its mode of transmission. Professor, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, the thoughts of Michael Portillo, who's alongside me. I don't know. I'm going to make a guess that had there been no COVID, no lockdown, no pandemic, we wouldn't be talking about the story today, I don't think, in quite the same way, at least. I, I, and maybe not, but I think we would be talking about it. Uh, the, the photographs uh, tell you that it's something we would be talking about, don't they? Because, you know, it is an unpleasant looking disease. It's not something that any of us want to get. I think politically it gets a bit, bit awkward because what everyone is sort of hedging around is that this can be transmitted by sex. And Pre predominantly gay sex. I don't know whether that's the case or not, but certainly by sexual contact. But if what you say is right, it's even more awkward because the government gets into this terrain that we were in in the 1980s about telling people about what sex they should be having and how they should be having it. This is nightmare territory yeah. politically. Yeah. But I guess that at some point, some public health messages have to go out um, because probably the best way of avoiding the numbers going up is if people are very careful um, about, about their activities, put yeah. it that way. And, and, you know, as you say, that's really sensitive territory because people say yes. the government's got no right to be moralising on this one. Yes. And, 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 you know, the little exchange we had there, I don't know whether it's particularly gay or not, but, but that is one of the sensitivities. Yes, no, understood. Michael, thanks very much. Uh, the government's warning energy companies they could face a windfall tax if they do not reinvest their... I think it's fair to say bumper profits right now, at least. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Simon Clark, says that imposing such a levy couldn't be ruled out, that all options were on the table as a consequence. Earlier, during a visit to a school, the Prime Minister was asked if he was in favour of imposing a windfall tax. No option is off the table. Let's be absolutely clear about that. I'm not attracted uh, intrinsically uh, to new taxes, but as I've said throughout, we've got to do what we can and we will, to look after people through the aftershocks of, of COVID, uh, through the current uh, pressures on energy prices that we're seeing uh, post-COVID and with what's going on in, in Russia. Uh, and we're going to put our arms around people just as we did during the pandemic. Prime Minister, earlier today, let's get the thoughts of the director of Net Zero Watch. That's Benny Pizer. Uh, Benny, very good afternoon to you. Uh, it feels like we are being inexorably dragged. The government's been dragged towards a position on a windfall tax. Um, perhaps some disagreement between number 10 and number 11. Number 11 about the timing of it, how much, how, how much ought to be reinvested by the, the big energy companies. But it does feel like the argument is being won by the opposition on this. Yeah. I mean, the government is all over the place on, on the windfall tax. I mean, the country is in terrible, terrible mess. Uh, the energy crisis is diabolical. Um, millions of families are struggling. Something has to be done. And the government it has no idea uh, what they can do. Uh, we've been calling for months now to get rid of the green levies uh, on the bills and the VAT on the bills. Um, I mean, the windfall tax will not make such a big difference. After all, it might just, you know, cut energy bills by 30 or 50 pounds. And only if all the tax, the complete amount of tax 
uh, is handed back to consumer, which is which is questionable. So the government is in deep, deep trouble. And um, personally, I think they will cave. Just on the green levies, what, what proportion of, of people's household domestic bills is made up of what you describe as those green levies? Well, uh, the average household currently pays roughly £150 uh, on the green levies, and they have to pay another roughly £250 uh, on the cost of living because all the businesses uh, have to pay the green levies and they are passing that on to consumers. So we're talking uh, roughly altogether a cost to consumers of roughly £400 uh, per household. Um, so that's, you know, a sizable uh, amount. It doesn't even cover the rise in costs, but it would help minimize the pain. Uh, and the government has been reluctant to cut uh, these levies. As I said, the windfall tax will not be such a big, make such a big difference. So the government has to do something because the pain is, is growing and come October, millions of families will struggle to pay their bills, will be unable to pay their bills. This is the director of Net Zero Watch. Appreciate your time, Benny. Thanks very much indeed. Michael Portillo alongside me. Something must be done. It's the oldest cry in politics. But what? Well, I think the windfall tax is a little bit of a red herring because um, nobody quite knows how you would spend this money. Uh, and, and that is the big problem. The, the, the government needs to know how it can get money to people that need it and not give it to you and me who frankly do not. And so if you cut energy bills, of course you're cutting them for everyone, whether they're in need or whether they're not. Um, the windfall tax just gives you a little bit more money than you had otherwise, but the decision as to how you reach people who are vulnerable uh, remains. I would have thought probably the most likely thing by now is that the universal credit, which is uprated once a year, you would bring forward the uprating because what's happening at the moment is that people are suffering inflation now and that inflation won't be recognised until their benefits go up next April. And I think you could quite simply bring that forward. It will cost you a bit of money. But on the other hand, at least it's going to people who are uh, in need. Something very interesting is changing. I mean, we were just talking there to uh, Net Zero Watch. Um, Simon Clark, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, was on radio this morning. And he said, oh, we wouldn't necessarily have to have the windfall tax if the companies would invest in the North Sea in oil and gas. Well, a few months ago, we were talking about no more investment in oil and gas. Notice how the tone <laughs> has changed. Because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we're now talking about security of supply. So developing more oil and gas in Britain is back on the cards, and that's been an enormous change. And that's real politique. Just in terms of the principle of, of the thing, as a Conservative, are you not really quite uncomfortable with the state reneging on a promise not to nick your money as a private operator? Yes, I am, although the, the vulnerability that I have is that this happened under Margaret Thatcher, which is extraordinary. But, of course, Margaret Thatcher, you knew that she was a Tory, so she could occasionally do non-Tory things. And you think, ah, that's the exception, of almost, that proves the rule. Yeah. The trouble is with Boris that we have no idea whether he's a Tory at all, so that's why it's more difficult for him to do <laughs> un-Tory things. We'll better leave that one there. <laughs> <laughs> and there is the Prime Minister pictured earlier. Uh, now, when families fail and can't be trusted to bring up their, their own children anymore, the state has to intervene. It then costs you, the taxpayer, about three quarters of a million pounds per child to pick up the pieces. A quarter of the prison population and a quarter of those said to be living rough on the streets started life in care. Well, a report out today, it's been debated right now in the House of Commons, makes clear a, a that life for kids in care homes and awaiting for foster care is actually, if anything, worsening. The report's being discussed, as I say, right now in the House of Commons. Uh, our TV viewers can see live pictures of that. Apologies if you're listening on radio. It's a man about uh, sitting down in the dispatch box. Uh, the report's publication follows the, the killings, uh, high-profile crimes, the killing of toddlers Arthur Labinger Hughes and Star Hobson, who died in separate incidents in, in 2020. Ministers have pledged change, they say, within months. Uh, Chris Wilde is an author and campaigner for children in care. He went into care at the age of 11. Uh, Chris, thanks for your time. Um, Thank you. I, I think a lot of people, and I'm one of them, will be pleased uh, that we are discussing this today. This is one of those stories which w warrants so much attention and actually gets so little. 
yeah, it's always a taboo subject, isn't it? It's like mental health 30 years ago. And it's shocking for me. I've been part of the care review for 15 months that, you know, we're, we're, we're having this review now. This should have been happening when I was in the care sector. Um, but finally, it's here and the recommendations look positive, but we've just got to make sure we can implement them. And that's where the hard work begins. Chris, a social worker once said to me, we, we get a sort of hokey cokey. You'll have a really high profile case like baby P. The cry goes up. We, we, we can't leave kids with vulnerable, in vulnerable, chaotic families. They need taking away from those families and putting into care. Then a few years go by and we see the outcomes of being in state care are equally wretched and actually sometimes for a bigger number of kids. And then we allow more kids to stay with their parents until there's a high profile case. And we get this hideous cycle. Yeah, it's, uh, you know what, and it's, it's, it's like a fish tank, isn't it? It's just swimming around all the time. Um, and, and as the saying goes, out of the frying pan into the fire, and that's how it is in the care sector, where we remove children for safety, yet the paradox of a care home is that, you know, you're supposed to be kept safe, but you're surrounded by danger. And that's where we've got to look at the system and, and, and look at the failures and see how we can fix those loopholes. Kids are failing every day. Uh, as you've just said, you've just called, but lots of young people end up leaving the care sector, end up homeless, they end up uh, in jail. But we don't have the stats of how many of those end up committing suicide, which is a, a high, vast number. It's by the time we had a complete overall of the care review. It's failed. It's never, ever been successful since day one. And it's, it's a sad shame and it's a sad reality, but you know, these high profile cases is the only time we ever talk about it. And you know, kids are dying every day. We don't see that. We don't see that. The media don't publish that. But now it's is so the time. True. For me, this is, sorry, go on. Yep. Well, I, I was gonna make the point. One thing that came out of this report was this idea that uh, pay, helping, say, grandparents or yeah. aunt, you know, aunts and uncles who want to help. The, the parents failed for a variety of reasons. The child's in danger. Other members of the extended family want to step up. And, and all too often, they're not given the support. I don't, I, such a vague word, support. Sometimes it can, it can actually mean money. Sometimes it can mean something more practical than that. But they're not getting the support mm. even when they want to step up. Yeah, it's very true. Even myself, when I was taken to care at 11 years old, there wasn't an option for me to stay with my grandparents or my uncle, and it would have saved a lifetime of misery throughout my 20s if that was an option back then. And we're still here today. You know, it's, it's more convenient to support, again, that word support, the families, um, which would be cost effective for the government long term, instead of putting that child into a care where it can cost up to 10,000 pound a week. It doesn't make sense to me. And then we have to start talking about cure is, is, is you know, prevention is cheaper than cure. These are the answers, but the government's got to respond to it and it's got to respond very quick. Chris, we're, we're out of time. Just can you, in one word, just tell me what saved, what turned your life around out of the care system? Can you do that really pithily for us? Yeah, I can say it really quick, but I had a very good advocate in my life, someone who believed in me, someone who motivated me to change my life around. Off on the way. Chris Wilde, really appreciate your time so we didn't have longer to talk about it. Thanks a lot. Coming up, as two more fans are arrested after a pitch invasion at Man City yesterday, are we going back to the, the bad old days of football hooliganism? A sports lawyer will have his say on that. Back in a sec. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a Brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Two football fans have been charged over an incident at the Etihad Football Stadium after Manchester City's Premier League win yesterday. As the final whistle marked the club's fourth title in five seasons, thousands of City fans poured onto the pitch, uh, destroying the goalposts and throwing blue flares. Greater Manchester Police are also investigating the assault of Villa's keeper, Robin Olsen. Well, it follows this. Other recent pitch invasions, including a fan who was jailed for headbutting Sheffield United's Billy Sharp after their game against Knott's Forest. Um, let's turn to the sports lawyer and head of front row legal, that is Richard Kramer. Richard Kramer, appreciate your time. Thank you. Is, is this a return to the 1980s? Let's hope not. Uh, those were very dark days in football. Um, the whole idea of the Premier League and new money coming into the sport was really to make uh, going to football matches an entertaining event for families uh, and uh, without any fear of, of, of violence. Uh, this last few days has seen, unfortunately, uh, a number of incidents already resulting from kind of pitch invasions. So in one sense, let's hope it's just a kind of one-off because we're getting these incidents as almost it's the final match of the season. On the other hand, uh, is this going to be a new trend that becomes fashionable for football hooligans? We don't know yet. I, I was reflecting last week on the 37th anniversary of the Bradford City fire. Uh, I had the misfortune of being in the grandstand when it happened. Uh, the death toll was 56. It would have been higher had there been big fences that people couldn't have climbed over. Are we going to see a return of fencing, do you think? Well, of course, this, this has in the past had its own problems. And, of course, we know Hillsborough terrible tragedy there. A lot of the problems stem from the fact that the, 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 the fans were penned in uh, with caged fences. And so um, we moved away, football's moved away from, from that type of uh, environment and that type of atmosphere. Uh, clearly, what's going to have to happen now is, is the clubs, certainly towards these games, towards the end of the season, will probably be under some kind of restrictions, there might be some uh, points deduction, there might be fines if they don't police uh, these sorts of incidents where the fans are in effect invading the pitch. Uh, that's not necessarily the problem, it's, it's what happens on the pitch and as we're looking at photographs now, that's unsavoury and of course uh, well documented really what happened to Billy Sharp last week. Uh, today uh, we've seen a couple more people charged. Uh, so there seems to be a trend here. Uh, thankfully, um, I've just been doing some research, um, there is sufficient legislation in place now to kind of at least the Crown Prosecution Service to charge fans in relation to football uh, hooliganism and disorder. Uh, and in fact, there is a, an offence under the Football Offences Act for throwing missiles onto the pitch or going into the playing area. And it would appear, in, in my view, to be now a, a question of the clubs, the FA, the football authorities, liaising with the Crown Prosecution Service to make sure that uh, any of fans that are, in effect, guilty of any form of public disorder should be prosecuted. Richard Kramer, appreciate your expertise and your time. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Michael Portillo alongside me. I mean, there is a joyous element to this, calling it football hooliganism, and clearly some people were intent on trouble. But it, a lot of them weren't. They were celebrating a happy day. It doesn't matter. It's against the law to go on the pitch. And uh, we've got to go through those photographs now. We've got to pick out every face. Those people have got to be banned from ever going to those uh, matches again. 
Uh, they've got to be prosecuted. This has got to be stopped absolutely in its tracks. Uh, clubs will have to have points deducted. They have to have their uh, fixtures cancelled. We can't go back to fences and we can't go back to hooliganism. Someone comes onto the pitch, uh, a player doesn't know whether he's about to be assaulted or not. And the assumption must be that a player might be assaulted and that's why we've got to err on the side of caution. It is illegal to go onto a football pitch and we must crack down on it. OK, Michael, thank you. Uh, coming up, we're going to be debating whether MPs have lost touch with reality. The Chancellor and his wife made the Sunday Times rich list this weekend. Uh, they are one of the wealthiest couples in the UK. Does it matter? Uh, we'll bring you up to the... Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But also, we'll bring you the latest news headlines with Thames in first. Colin, thank you. It's 4.33. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Downing Street has confirmed the meeting between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray during her investigation was first suggested by Number 10. Officials say Boris Johnson discussed the timings and publication process of her findings into lockdown breaches. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says the meeting was an attempt to undermine the report. A former Conservative MP has been sentenced to 18 months in prison for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Imran Ahmed Khan was expelled from the Conservative Party and resigned from the Commons after he was convicted last month. The 48-year-old carried out the attack in 2008. The Prime Minister says he's not in favour of new taxes to ease the cost of living crisis. But as pressure grows to introduce a windfall tax on oil and gas companies, Boris Johnson says no option is off the table. I'm not attracted uh, intrinsically uh, to new taxes, but as I've said throughout, we've got to do what we can and we will to look after people through the aftershocks of, of Covid, uh, through the current uh, pressures on energy prices that we're seeing uh, post-Covid and with what's going on in, in Russia. A health worker has been arrested on suspicion of poisoning a child who died at Birmingham Children's Hospital on Thursday. The 27-year-old has since been released pending further inquiries and suspended by the hospital. The World Health Organization has said there is no evidence the monkeypox virus has mutated, but it expects to find more cases in countries where it's not typically found. Scotland confirmed its first case of the virus this morning, bringing the total number in the UK to at least 21. The WHO, technical lead for COVID-19, says the situation is containable. Transmission is really happening from close physical contact, skin to skin contact. So it's not, it's, it's quite different than COVID in that sense. So we are looking for people who have rash um, so we can help them first and foremost to understand what their risk is. And we should say that most of the people who have been identified so far have had more mild disease or let's say not severe disease. Um, but anyone they come in contact with needs to be informed so that we can prevent onward spread. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Back to Colin in just a moment. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. 
So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Nearly 20 to 5, not quite. Uh, this is GB News with Colin Brazier on TV, online and on digital radio. Our top stories this afternoon. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson says it's important we keep an eye on monkeypox after 21 people were diagnosed with the virus in the UK. The UK Health Security Agency advising anyone at the highest risk of having caught it to, dread word, isolate for 21 days. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury says energy companies could face a windfall tax if they don't reinvest their profits. Uh, Simon Clark, he of great height, made the comments as he acknowledged the extraordinary pressures on family finances. And a report into children's social care in England suggests tens of thousands more children could end up in care without radical changes to the existing system. Now, a health worker has been arrested on suspicion of administering poison with intent to endanger life after a child died at Birmingham Children's Hospital. The 27-year-old woman was arrested on Thursday, hours after the death, and has since been suspended from her role. Let's turn to our reporter, Will Hollis, who's outside the hospital this afternoon. Will, welcome to you. What do we know? Yes, well, there's obviously limited things that we can say right now because somebody has been arrested. This all started on Thursday after the sudden death of an infant here at Birmingham Children's Hospital. West Midlands Police started to investigate. They arrested uh, that woman who is now uh, believed to be a nurse from a property here in the West Midlands and as you said there she was arrested on the suspicion of administering a poison with intent to endanger life. Now uh, while the police continue to investigate this they say that they have released the woman. They say that they're waiting on certain bits of information which also include forensics. Now uh, Birmingham uh, Children's Hospital here and the trust that runs it say that they are obviously working really closely with the family. They're asking uh, also for their privacy to be respected at this time, which is obviously quite a worrying time. Right now, we don't know um, very, we know very little uh, about the child. We don't know, um, for example, if it was a boy or a girl. We don't know how old they are, but we know that uh, the, the, the woman uh, who's been arrested by West Midlands Police, she has been suspended from her job here at Birmingham's Children's Hospital. And uh, we know that this is something that the media are going to be looking at very closely. A lot of people are going to be really interested in, in what has happened here and why it might have happened. But right now we are still uh, waiting on the process of the investigation that West Midlands Police are conducting right now to take place. Thank you, Will. Uh, moving on now, it's time for our debate this hour. We're asking our... It's a question we've put before. We're trying it again. Are our politicians out of touch? Asking the question because of this. And him, uh, Rishi Sunak, the first frontline politician to be ranked amongst the UK's wealthiest 250 people, uh, days after the Chancellor warned consumers that the next few months will be tough, with inflation climbing to levels not seen for years. Uh, the Rich List, it was first published in 1989, and for decades before that, of course, politicians were obviously uh, often fabulously wealthy. But in more meritocratic times, can an MP, as affluent it seems as Rishi Sunak, really understand the cost of living crisis? So for our debate this hour, we're asking, is the Chancellor, indeed many of our elected politicians, out of touch with reality? Uh, Michael Portillo is here, former MP, and the political editor at the Sunday Mirror and Sunday People, Nigel Nelson, joins us as well. Nigel Nelson, welcome to you. Your view? 
Um, well, backbench MPs should be working their own patch properly. They're holding surgeries. They should have. Uh, they should be in touch with real people and know what's going on. Same applies to local councillors. The real problem is as you go further up the scale and become a government minister, that's when you begin losing touch. So, for instance, when you are when you're a prime minister, you're tucked into a security bubble. Uh, you only go and meet people at staged events. So as a result of that, within six months, a prime minister has lost complete touch with real life. So if they come onto your program, for instance, Colin, and you ask them for uh, the cost of a, of a pint of milk or a loaf of bread, they'll be able to tell you, but only because it's been drilled into them, because they never have to actually go out and buy these things. On that, Michael Portillo, I have to say, I've never, I mean, I hope somebody doesn't dig up footage on the internet and embarrass me. I, I make a point of never asking that ludicrous gotcha question. It seems daft. I know people still do it. Somebody did it only last week. Um, park that, shall we? Uh, Michael, what say you're out of touch? I am. Um... Firstly, I'm very pleased to be debating with Nigel because I like him so much and we debate <laughs> together from time to time. Um, I think that anybody who earns £80,000 as a Member of Parliament does is somewhat out of touch. Uh, I don't know whether you get very much more out of touch as you climb the income scale because already 80000 is very far from the experience of many of your poorer um, constituents. And I don't say this to be offensive to Nigel or indeed to you, Colin, but I do think that um, Members of Parliament are less out of touch at least than journalists. Why? Because they have constituents, they have surgeries, they're looking at correspondence. When, when I was a Member of Parliament, I used to go to people's houses, I could see how they were living. I went to look at what they were telling me about, you know, damp or mould or whatever it was. And, and journalists are not doing that. Now, even Prime Ministers, I think, hold constituency surgeries. Uh, it certainly was the, well, certainly when I was a senior minister, I mean, I was in the Cabinet, I was still holding surgeries. So I think they do remain in touch. Now, also, you just have to th bear this in mind, that I think we have to rely on politicians, like many other people, to be able to make an imaginative leap. Of course they're not in the state of many of their constituents, and we can't require all members of parliament to be poor, but saying that a member of parliament can't have empathy because he or she is quite well yeah. off is a bit like saying, unless you're a king, you can't play Richard III. Yeah, Nigel, let's break this down a little bit. Just on the point about journalists being out of touch, I mean, I, I think Michael Portell is almost certainly right. Uh, there's, there's a tr tranche of journalists. They tend to be more junior, less well-paid. They're not leaving their newsrooms very much because they're, they're told just to keep writing those press releases. They're probably less in, far less in touch, I think, and I suspect you would agree with me, than was true, say, 30, 40 years ago. So we'll just nail that point to start with. Yes, and I think that, 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 uh, that the fact that so many journalists have to work online and are producing copy at a, a rapid rate uh, means often they're not going out enough. I mean, certainly our reporters do get out and about. And when Michael is talking about visiting people's homes and so on, that's exactly what uh, reporters do. So I don't think that the reporters are out of touch. There may be an, be an element of us political journalists in Westminster not seeing real people as often as we should. But of course, we can live out, out in the community in a way that I think that government ministers, this is not a, a party political point, it's happened to all governments, government ministers don't, that the civil servants give them so much to do, uh, they're completely tied up with, the, with their departmental job. And that makes it much more difficult to know what's going on. So we get the ridiculous situation of someone like George Eustace, the Environment Secretary, saying, oh, well, you can actually cut your food, your, your food bills by going for own brand, supermarket own brand foods. Or the Home Office Minister Rachel McLean saying, if, you, if you're struggling with money, go out and work a few more hours or get a better paid job. These are not realistic demands on people out there who are struggling. But Nigel, just on that point, I know they both copped a lot of flack on that, but it, I, I mentioned only last week to somebody, if, if those sentiments had been expressed by an equally well-paid celebrity nutritionist or chef, nobody would have battered an eyelid. Well, your, your celebrity nutritionist or chef is not actually making government policy. What these people are doing is deciding how the rest of us are going to live our lives. And that's why they need to be much more in touch. I think it applies also a bit to the civil service, that um, often policies are brought in where checks have not been made about how people will adapt to them. So taking, for instance, the bedroom tax, which was a, a big controversial policy, the idea was to tax 
any extra bedrooms to persuade people to move out into smaller homes. At no point did anyone check there were enough smaller homes in local authority housing stock to actually let them get out there. So it's mistakes like that that actually that do really stick in my craw. Uh, Michael Bortillo, we were just running pictures a while ago of Rishi Sunak. Um, let's just focus on him specifically, making the rich list as he's done with his wife. Do does that matter? Because, in a sense, to be Chancellor is not to be moored to reality. You are dealing with a lot of almost abstract concepts about macroeconomics. Uh, well, I mean, you are. That that's the gig. Well, the, the reason that he's very rich personally, as opposed to uh, because he married his wife, is because he was very successful in finance. And it's quite unusual to have a chancellor of the Exchequer who understands finance. Uh, and if the downside of having a chancellor who knows what he's talking about is that he got rich, I'm, I'm prepared to go along with that. Colin, to your, to your first point about asking the price of things, I, I, I remember talking to Margaret Thatcher when she was still leader of the opposition. And she would tell me, she said, you know, anchor butter this week is 16p the half pound, a wheelbarrow is 17p the half pound, which, by the way, tells you how long ago it was. Um, but there was a politician who really did uh, know about prices. Um, I think as soon as you pay someone £80,000, which is what a, a Member of Parliament gets, they are removed a bit from reality. Whether having £200 million removes you much further, I don't know, because I've never had the joyous experience of <laughs> having £200 million. Not yet, anyway. Uh, uh, and arguably it raises other questions about his commitment to the UK, because for some people he's part of that global elite who, who float around and couldn't quite get rid of his green card in time, etc. Et anyway, another story uh, in there. Let me just, gentlemen, while we've got both of you, let's just uh, tell our viewers about a, a story that's breaking in the past few moments. We're expecting, as many of you will know, and um, a lot of you won't care, the full Sue Gray report this week into Downing Street parties during lockdown. Within the last hour, ITV News, they've released pictures uh, they've obtained which appear to show the Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson, drinking at one of those parties. Uh, the Prime Minister um, pictured during lockdown. Four separate images were told uh, with the Prime Minister raising a glass. It would appear at a, uh, we're told, a leaving party on the 13th of November 2020 uh, with bottles of alcohol and party food on the table in front of him. Let's turn straight to Nigel Nelson as a political journalist who's been covering this story week in, week out. Does this knock it on much? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure it does, really, on the basis that we more or less knew this anyway. Um, so when it comes down to Sue Gray's report, uh, it seems to me that the, the, the moment has passed for Tory MPs to get rid of the Prime Minister unless there is something devastating in Sue Gray's report that we actually don't know about. So when you see a picture like this of Boris Johnson drinking at a party, we kind of knew that. And so uh, Conservative MPs haven't moved against him over that. So they're unlikely to, unless there's something we don't know. Michael Portello, a thought on this one? I, I think the photograph falls some distance short of Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's not exactly debauchery, is it? There, there, there's the Prime Minister wearing his tie, he's in his suit. It's obviously a part of or the end of a working day. We knew that there was a leaving due. We, we know that when there's a leaving due, you say good luck to Mr. So and so or Mrs. So and so and raise your glass. So I don't think the picture does take us very far forward. They seem to be quite well socially distanced. So I think it's entirely <laughs> compatible with most of what we knew already. Michael Portillo, Nigel Nelson, thanks both. More on that story throughout the course of the rest of the hour or so. Uh, now, though, it's time for 5 to 5, discussing five things that you might want to know before 5 o'clock. At 5, a Russian soldier has been jailed for life for killing a civilian at the first war crimes trial since the invasion of Ukraine began. This is a tank commander by the name of Vadim Shishishimarin, convicted of killing a 62-year-old in February. Ukraine also investigating a number of other alleged war crimes by Russian soldiers. Moscow has denied its troops targeted civilians during the invasion. At four, rail unions are fighting back over government threats to make strike action illegal unless a minimum number of trained staff work during a walkout. The National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers balloting staff over what they call the possibility of the biggest strike in modern history, bringing the country to a standstill, oh dear. Uh, Transport Secretary Grant Shapp says a law would protect freight shipments of goods, including vital staples like food and fuel. 
At three, the new police watchdog has called for a back-to-basics approach to policing. This is Andy Cook, the former chief constable of Merseyside, who says forces need to instill fear in criminals, suggesting the use of traditional methods like recruiting informants, neighbourhood policing, and at least assessing every crime, even if the value is under £50. Popular policies all, I suspect. At two, if you're looking to buy a new car this summer, it's set to cost you more. The cheapest car in the UK now costs more than £10,000 to buy new. This is according to Auto Express magazine. The Kia Picanto has been revealed as the most affordable car for 2022, with a starting price of £11,810, up from a Dacia Sandero, which last year would have set you back just under £9,000. That puts inflation in context, doesn't it? Big rise. And at one, forget fast food. There were long waits at one McDonald's this weekend after an angry customer <laughs> decided to block the drive through for two hours after refusing to park in a bay to wait for his double sausage and egg McMuffin. We've tried to invite Stuart Yates on to explain what happened. We've been unsuccessful. He said he'd wait for a week if necessary, but moved after two hours after police uh, were called. Those are the five things you might want to know before five o'clock this afternoon. Michael Portello is on hand. What caught your eye, Michael? Um, the, the sentence of the Russian soldier for committing a, a murder. If I may be allowed a moment of sympathy for a murderer, I think it is, it, he's a pathetic sight. I mean, he's a 21-year-old Russian kid who's been sent far from home and probably given appalling orders, probably has been ordered to commit murders. He's killed a 62-year-old civilian. But at the end of that, the reason why I'm very pleased that he's been given a life sentence after what appears to be a fair trial is that this may save life. Because if this sends a message to other Russians who are out there, that even if they are ordered to, to commit atrocities, that they will be held accountable for them, then lives may be saved in the future. And this will be the first of, I'm sure, possibly thousands of trials, because one allegation is that there may have been 11,000 crimes so far. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Mr Yates and his queue at the drive through McDonald's. I'm not, sure what, <laughs> I'm not sure what lessons we can draw from that, but you do get some people who occasionally... Oh, it struck me, he was somebody just being a little bit cussed, allegedly, making people wait for two hours. I mean, it's, you know, but, of course, he had... It's unusual to see the tables turned in McDonald's, this big dominating corporation who, you know, at the end of the day, if the, I don't know how often you use the McDonald's drive through Michael, but if somebody chooses to, blo to block it, you can't do much about it if the hand breaks on and they won't budge. Yes, you, you see the little man against the great corporation. Well, I do I, a bit. I, I, I see a rather, um, you know, a man with a short temper actually inconveniencing lots of members of the public. So you and I view this in rather different ways. I mean, I don't think McDonald's has suffered particularly from this, but all those poor people in their cars had to wait for their McDonald's. Uh, I suppose it might people, put people off eating McDonald's, and uh, what you should do when you eat a McDonald's is look at the number of calories. Good advice, as always. Michael Portillo, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Do let us know what you think of today's stories. Anything we should be covering a bit more, something we ought to be focusing on a little bit less. I know the Sue Gray report, uh, some of you really gets your dander up. You think we do far too much on that story. We are going to do a little more in the next hour. No apologies for that. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's certainly been a showery start to the week for many of us. Some sharp downpours out there, more prolonged rain in some places, but there'll also be a few clear spells coming along overnight. Now, the more prolonged rain at the moment caused by a weather front that's close to the southeast, that does push away, but to further showers or longer spells of rain are moving in from the west and northwest. And so that's during the evening, much of the UK seeing some heavy rain at times, a Fairly lively rash of showers crossing central and southern parts of the country, while some more persistent rain affects the far northeast of Scotland. Scattered showers continuing for western Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, but some clear spells in between for parts of the north and the west. And temperatures falling into the single figures, perhaps even the mid to low single figures in some sheltered northern parts. So a bright but chilly start to the day on Tuesday for many of us. Showers very quickly get going from the word go. Again, some heavy downpours out there, even some hail and thunder in the south. But away from the showers, some sunshine, particularly in the west, later in the afternoon into the evening. And temperatures around average for the time of year. So 15, 16 Celsius for Scotland, Northern Ireland, 17 or 18 for much of England and Wales. Showers continue rumbling on into the evening, especially in the east. Eventually, a clearer slot of weather moves west to east across the country, temperatures falling away as that happens. But by the morning on Wednesday, 
Well, once again, we'll see cloud and outbreaks of rain moving into the north and the west, winds picking up as well. So double figures to start things off on Wednesday in the west, single figures further east. A bright start for eastern England. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud, outbreaks of rain for Scotland, northern and western England, Wales and Northern Ireland, turning to showers later on. And Thursday brings with it more wind, more rain and showers before more settled weather on Friday. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hi there, welcome to Brazier. Coming up live at five, there's a warning from the UK Health Security Agency that anyone who's at the highest risk of having caught the monkeypox virus should isolate for 21 days. Within the last 10 minutes, the UK has confirmed that it now has 56 confirmed cases. We'll have more with a clinical virologist shortly. Also, could we be seeing the first signs of success for the Rwanda plan? Reports suggest asylum seekers are abandoning their attempts to stay in the UK because they're afraid they might be sent to Rwanda. I'll debate that with the journalist Sam Dowler and the director of the Centre of Migration and Economic Prosperity, Stephen Wolfe. And find out why rows of union flags on London's Regent Street have been causing little like controversy on social media. Where else? And with me for the next two hours, the former Defence Secretary, Michael Portillo. But first, the latest news headlines with Tamsin. Colin, thank you. It's just after five o'clock. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. New images of the Prime Minister have emerged, appearing to show him at a party in Downing Street during the second lockdown. In the pictures obtained by ITV News, Boris Johnson is seen raising a glass in a room with a number of other people. According to the broadcaster, the image was taken on the 13th of November 2020. Just eight days earlier, Boris Johnson had imposed England's second national lockdown, which lasted four weeks. The Prime Minister says he doesn't want to introduce new taxes to ease the cost of living crisis. But as pressure grows to introduce a windfall tax on oil and gas companies, Boris Johnson says no option is off the table. Speaking at a school in South East London, he suggested more support will be offered to help households. I'm not attracted uh, intrinsically uh, to new taxes, but as I've said throughout, we've got to do what we can and we will to look after people through the aftershocks of, of COVID, 
uh, through the current uh, pressures on energy prices that we're seeing uh, post-COVID and with what's going on in, in Russia. Well, Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer says the Prime Minister isn't moving fast enough. I think there's a range of things that need to be looked at and uh, reinstating universal credit is one of them. There's all sorts of work that needs to be done on benefits as well. But the windfall tax is a simple solution which could be voted through Parliament very easily. Labour, it's Labour's plan. We'll vote for it if the government brings it forward. Um, but dithering and delaying is actually the thing that's stopping people getting that money to help them with their bills because £600 for those that need it most will make a huge, huge difference. A former Conservative MP has been sentenced to 18 months in prison for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Imran Ahmed Khan was expelled from the Conservative Party and resigned from the Commons after he was convicted last month. The 48-year-old carried out the attack in 2008. Meanwhile, Downing Street has confirmed the meeting between Boris Johnson and Sue Gray while she was investigating lockdown rule breaches was first suggested by Number 10. Officials say they asked for a meeting to discuss the timings and publication process of her findings. Labour claims the meeting was an attempt to undermine the report. A health worker at Birmingham Children's Hospital has been arrested on suspicion of poisoning an infant with intent of endangering life. The 27-year-old woman has been suspended from her position while the police investigation is underway. West Midlands Police says the child's family is being supported by specially trained officers. The World Health Organization has said there is no evidence the monkeypox virus has mutated, but it expects to find more cases in countries where it's not typically found. The number of cases in England has now risen to 56. The UK Health Security Agency says the government is advising people who are at high risk of catching the disease to isolate for 21 days. Earlier, the WHO technical lead for COVID-19 says the situation is containable. Transmission is really happening from close physical contact, skin to skin contact. So it's not, it's, it's quite different than COVID in that sense. So we are looking for people who have rash um, so we can help them first and foremost to understand what their risk is. And we should say that most of the people who have been identified so far have had more mild disease or let's say not severe disease. Um, but anyone they come in contact with needs to be informed so that we can prevent onward spread. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says the world faces a turning point since Russia's invasion of his country. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, Ukraine's leader is urging countries to increase pressure on Moscow. He says all foreign businesses must leave the Russian market so they're not associated with what he called war crimes. His comments come as the first war crimes trial since the invasion has taken place. A Russian soldier has been jailed for life for the murder of an unarmed civilian. The UN Refugee Agency says 6.5 million people have now fled the country. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe says she was forced to sign a false confession before being allowed to leave Iran. Speaking to Emma Barnett on BBC's Women's Hour, the British Iranian national says it happened in front of a UK government witness and was filmed. Mrs. Zagari Ratcliffe says she expects Tehran to use it against her in future. I'm sure they will show that someday. Of you signing a confession? Of me signing it, even though it was under duress. And I just want to, uh, to put it uh, here... Um, on the record. On the record, that um, all the forced confessions that we have been exposed to, they have no value. They are just propaganda for the Iran Iranian regime to show how scary they are and they can do whatever they want to do. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens, of course. Now, though, back to Colin. Coming up to seven minutes past five. Now, the government's advised that contacts of those diagnosed with monkeypox ought to self-isolate for 21 days. The UK Health Security Agency says anyone who's had unprotected direct contact with a confirmed case shouldn't travel and should avoid pregnant women, children and the immunosuppressed. The UK Health Security Agency has said within the past 20, 25 minutes or thereabouts that they have received 56 
56 now confirmed cases. Uh, let's turn to uh, the Professor of Respiratory Sciences at the University of Leicester, Dr Julian Tang. Uh, doctor, thanks for your time. Um, it's important uh, that we may be newly sensitised to viruses, obviously in the wake of the pandemic, that this is not shaping up to be anyth anything remotely like a serious. No, so monkeypox transmissibility is less in COVID from what we know from previous uh, studies. Um, but there is an issue of the rash, and the rash is actually quite deep. It's deeper than chickenpox, and we know that the rash leaves scars, especially on the face where you get the highest density of spots if you do get monkeypox. So although the cases are low, the transmissibility is low, and the incubation period is higher, uh, longer rather, I should say, the, trans the scabbing that uh, you get with monkeypox um, at the end of infection can leave quite nasty scars. It's treatment, um, we'll come back to the symptoms, but in terms of the, the treatment, the smallpox vaccine, uh, I mean, smallpox eradicated from the UK, you know, from the mainstream population decades ago, but we're told it's around about 80, 90% effective against monkeypox too. Yeah, so the two vaccines, one is the old fashioned one, the, uh, the ACAM uh, 2000, I think it is, which was based on the vaccinia virus, a live vaccinia virus. That's actually more effective, we think, than the more modern one, which is safer without replicating virus in it, uh, which is slightly less effective. But overall, we think at least 85% protection. Uh, I'm not sure which one the government's actually bought, but 85% um, uh, protection is what is quoted. In terms of transmissibility, how transmissible? So uh, much less transmissible than, say, measles or, or flu or even COVID. Um, but we do acknowledge that there, are, there is some limited aerosol transmission. Um, but you have to be in more prolonged contact, uh, maybe closer. Uh, but of course, if you're strangers on a plane or bus or train, you don't have intimate contact with strangers. Uh, but you do share the same airspace. So over time, like, you know, several hours, you may be exposed to aerosols of, of monkeypox. And there are documented human to human transmission of cases and even some animal experiments that, that support this as well. I, I read, Doctor, that the WHO may, may be considering declaring an emergency. I mean, what would, the, what would that change? How would that change things? Well, I think people, uh, if they maintain the COVID precautions, uh, masking, social distancing, even though those restrictions have been lifted, some people are still using them, especially those who are most vulnerable, that will also protect you against uh, monkeypox uh, infection as well. Um, if the WHO declares a, a fake, as we call it, but we have the Ministry of International Concern, uh, PHEIC, uh, then people will be more aware of this and may choose to maintain those COVID-related precautions a bit longer because they'll also work against monkeypox. Julian Tang, really appreciate your time today. Thanks ever so much. Uh, Michael Portillo is alongside me through the course of the next hour to uh, ponder on this one and the rest of the day's stories. Uh, we are obviously a bit more focused on viruses than we might have been a while ago. Uh, this is looking not especially serious, but as the doctor makes clear, uh, there can be lasting side effects. Yes, that was new information to me, although I should have known that because I, I knew that smallpox left uh, scars on people. Uh, I also didn't know until that interview that there was aerosol tr transmission. I was happily thinking that unless you touch someone, you weren't going to get it. So actually, I was mildly disturbed by that interview. And by the way, it is 56, whereas a few days ago it was 20. And one of the things we've learned is that a thing that doubles every day, I I'm not saying this is doubling every day, it isn't yet, but a thing that doubles and then doubles and doubles, you start with a small number and you end with a very large number. So I think, I think we do need to be quite cautious. If, if I were in government now, I would be... I'd be calling a lot of meetings. I'd want to understand exactly what the dimensions of this thing are. Interesting. Really interesting. Michael, thank you. Um, energy companies could face a windfall tax if they do not reinvest their profits. That's the warning from uh, Simon Clark, Chief Secretary to the Treasury. He says imposing such a levy could not be ruled out and that all options remained on the table. Uh, this morning, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, reiterated his call for the windfall tax. Part of the answer is staring the Prime Minister in the face, and that's Labour's plan for a windfall tax on oil and gas companies and using that money directly to reduce bills by up to £600 for those who need it most. But what's the government doing? It's dithering, it's delaying. Last week they voted against a windfall tax. Now they're saying they're looking at a windfall tax. They need to get a grip of this situation because every day they dither and delay, more people are struggling, really struggling, with their bills.
Let's turn to the leader of Reform UK, Richard Tice, who joins me now. Hi to you, Richard. The, the fact that Keir Starmer has call, has, is calling for this today, has been calling for it for weeks, actually, ironically, makes it less likely to happen. Well, the truth is, Colin, we've all been calling for it for weeks and weeks and weeks, but it's only a small part. I mean, the windfall tax alone would only count for just over £100. There's another big windfall being made by the renewable companies, Colin, who, because of the rate of inflation being so high, they're getting their own particular windfall of hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. So I, Reform UK are saying there should be a windfall tax on them. But the reality is that's nothing like enough. This is the gravest crisis for 70 years. And we're calling that they should get rid of VAT on energy bills. That's one of the Brexit opportunities that they seem unwilling to use. And we should get rid of these environmental levies that account for about 25% of everybody's electricity bills. The truth is the government's finances are in much more robust health than we're being told. There's huge amounts, I mean, billions and billions of government waste that they can cut out. So this is very affordable. What none of us can understand, who actually are in touch with the, the depth of this crisis, is why the government is dithering, delaying, sitting on the fence, rather than actually acting to help the people across the whole country. Somebody who's been in business, and just to take the part of the BPs and the Shells for a second, they will say, look, this is a real disincentive to the stuff we do. We have, we, yes, we're having a good year. Uh, part of that's down to our lights. Part of it's down to circumstance and the, what's happening globally. But actually, don't forget the dreadful years when we make huge losses. We're a business, and like all businesses, you've got to see us over a period of, of, of time. Look, for sure, but the reality is these energy producers, they invest over decades, not one or two years. And yes, they have good and bad years, but they have a sort of an average price at which it's worth investing. Um, and we are seeing huge, huge windfalls way, way above that. And we, we heard it from one of the bosses themselves that actually it wouldn't act as a disincentive. And I, I repeat what I said, Colin, this is the gravest economic crisis that, that any of us have seen almost in living memory. Uh, it's far worse than I think the government uh, is given the way we're acting. And, and there's no guarantees that inflation's going to stop here. It could well be that energy prices continue to go up. And, and we think that, you know, at the end of the day, it's economics, and I'm quite sure that Michael Portillo would agree, you have, if you cut taxes, you get higher growth. And if you get higher growth, you get higher wages, you get higher tax revenues in the medium term. So, the government should be doing basic economics, cutting taxes, not raising them. And, and that's how you actually get this cost of living crisis. And that's how we will stop what is potentially a deep, deep recession hitting everybody hard in the face. Richard Tice, as ever, appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Michael Portillo is alongside me. Um, is Richard Tice right when he says this is a, as serious an economic crisis as anybody can remember? I, I don't know. I mean, I lived through, you lived through very severe inflation in the uh, 1970s. It hit 26, 27 per cent. Um, one of the reasons that that was very serious was that, of course, wages were also going up at the same rate, which meant that those who were in work were doing rather well and those who were retired were doing terribly because their savings were being uh, exhausted. What we haven't got to yet in this crisis is the wage catch up. We're seeing this playing out now with the railways. One of the things that the uh, union is saying is that they want an 8% increase because it's got to be in line with inflation. And everybody's going to say that. And mm. those who've got the muscle are probably going to achieve it. So the thing is going to get worse. On, on the other hand, some of the causes of inflation are likely to turn down again. I mean, most people are saying the year, year and a half, uh, it's, there's going to be a downturn. Uh, just to be mischievous, so Richard was calling there for windfall taxes, not only on, on oil, but also on, on renewables. And he also wants tax cuts. So I got, I got a tiny bit confused as we went through <laughs> what Richard was saying, but he's not there to reply anymore, so that's a bit unfair. Uh, just, just a thought on the fact that we've got these inflationary pressures on, on wages. Might it be that we are going through a big reset so that tanker drivers and people who work in care and you know, people who work in, in quotes, menial jobs get paid more. And people who've done their media studies degrees, and I'm afraid, racked up lots of debt, suddenly find that they're less saleable than they thought they were. I very much doubt it. Uh, the people who will get the money are the people who've got muscle. 
So it's, it'll, it'll be the train drivers who, who get the money. Yeah. And the people in care homes don't have any muscle, so they won't get the money. I'm afraid that's real politic. Yeah, Michael, thank you. Let's move on uh, to this story, a new report into children's social care. It's calling for an overhaul of the system in England to stop the country being left with a huge bill as well as the human cost of often wasted lives. A quarter of all homeless people and a quarter of all prisoners have been in care. Many of them fall prey to exploitation sometimes while they are still in the care of the state. Uh, the report's publication follows the killing of the toddlers, Arthur Labinio Hughes and Star Hobson, who died in separate incidents, but in the same year in 2020. Uh, let's turn to the independent child protection and safeguarding consultant, Ken Palmer, who joins me now. Uh, Ken, uh, welcome to you. What do you think people who are, haven't given this a lot of thought, what should they be taking away from this report? Good afternoon, Colin. Um, it's a comprehensive report. Um, and the good thing for me is that we are talking about safeguarding and child protection. It kind of puts it on the table when we're talking about it. So I welcome that. Um, and it also deals with, you know, the point th from, from initial contact right through to, to care. Um, so the executive summary that I've kind of looked at, um, you know, what I have seen and read thus far is, is encouraging. Um, I'm looking down at it now as I'm, I'm talking to you. Um, and as a, you know, I view it as a, as a practitioner, you know, I, I am very much a kind of practitioner, um, you know, working within, with, within the system. And, you know, I certainly welcome uh, some of the, the ideas and suggestions. Um, I like what I see uh, with, you know, the more, more support family hubs, for example. That's something that um, I've been talking about for a while um, with, with colleagues um, in, in schools, I work very much with s schools and um, uh, people who who, uh, who are responsible for safeguarding children in schools. And for a while, we've been talking about this this kind of family hub uh, setup where you maybe had social workers, uh, family liaison officers, um, effective schools, police officers, you know, working with communities. Um, you know, so I, I very much kind of welcome that idea, family help teams um, and hubs. Um, yeah, more the more use of, of foster carers as well. Uh, you, you know, can, Anne Longfield if, published if, a report. If, Sorry, if, Colin. If, yeah. if you can find them, Ken, if you can find the foster carers. Look, we're, we're running a bit short of time, but uh, thanks for that snap reaction to that report. Ken Palmer there, thanks very much indeed. Michael Portillo here in the studio, uh, reflecting as you were an hour ago when we discussed this last... And in the House of Commons, they, they were debating this report, but very few people were there. Yes, those listening on the radio won't have seen the picture, but if there were 20 people in the chamber, I would be surprised. Both, both benches, both Labour and Conservative, were pretty much uh, deserted. Uh, I don't think this probably is a big moment, this report. Uh, I think, like many reports, it will, uh, it will die the death. It won't, it won't be talked about very much. Uh, I'd, I'd flag up two things. The first is it calls for £2.6 billion over five years which I think is a bit daft, quite honestly, because, you know, the author must know that that money isn't available. Anyway, it puts great faith in money, and I don't think those two children whose deaths we've just referenced back in 2020 would have been saved by 2.6 billion or 10 billion, for that matter. There were other failings in the system. There's also an extraordinary thing in the report, which is that there should be a windfall tax on the independent sector, which looks after children. That just struck me as ideological or kind of punitive. And... I confess I don't know a great deal about this subject, but it made me very suspicious of the report. I thought, where did this, where did this yeah. idea come from? Yeah, it's a shame. It's, it's slightly, it, it took the edge off it a little bit for me because I think, like you, I agree, it's a sort of Cinderella area that needs a lot more attention. Uh, what none of our guests, and it's probably my failings as an interviewer, have brought to life yet, and in a sense it's difficult to bring it to life, is just the, the grinding, hideous daily reality of growing up in a children's care home. And I'm sure you've talked to constituents. I've, I've talked to, down the years, guests who've painted a picture of something really rather grim. And I wonder sometimes whether we can look at modern social ills, the breakdown of marriage, uh, uh, you know, when I put my sort of social conservative hat on. But actually, when you look at it, we're still only, to only, only talking about 80,000 kids out of a population of 67 million people in this country. So it is possible to go overboard about this, but it's still a very, very serious problem. 
I mean, obviously some kids have horrific experiences and their life chances are definitely reduced. But again, going to the report, there's an extraordinary idea that one of the ways you help them is to add them to the protected categories. Uh, but there's so much jargon in this area, which yeah. makes me think that people aren't thinking straight. So you won't know what a protected category is, perhaps. Uh, maybe you do, Colin, maybe viewers don't, I don't know. But it's adding it to, you know, protected categories are things like um, uh, sexual minorities and women and so on. And the idea is that we would add them to protected categories so that employers wouldn't discriminate against them. I mean, this seems such a bureaucratic answer to a deeply human problem. Again, I really wonder whether this can be on the right track. Michael, thanks very much indeed. Let's move on. As uh, two more fans are arrested after a pitch invasion at Manchester City yesterday, uh, we're asking this question. Are we lurching? Are we lurching perhaps back to the days, the old bad old days of 1980s-style football hooliganism? The sports broadcaster and regular contributor here, Aidan McGee, will be pondering on that one. First, we've got the weather for you. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's certainly been a showery start to the week for many of us. Some sharp downpours out there, more prolonged rain in some places, but there'll also be a few clear spells coming along overnight. Now, the more prolonged rain at the moment caused by a weather front that's close to the southeast, that does push away, but to further showers or longer spells of rain are moving in from the west and northwest. And so that's during the evening, much of the UK seeing some heavy rain at times, a Fairly lively rash of showers crossing central and southern parts of the country, while some more persistent rain affects the far northeast of Scotland. Scattered showers continuing for Western Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, but some clear spells in between for parts of the north and the west. And temperatures falling into the single figures, perhaps even the mid to low single figures in some sheltered northern parts. So a bright but chilly start to the day on Tuesday for many of us. Showers very quickly get going from the word go. Again, some heavy downpours out there, even some hail and thunder in the south. But away from the showers, some sunshine, particularly in the west, later in the afternoon into the evening. And temperatures around average for the time of year. So 15, 16 Celsius for Scotland, Northern Ireland, 17 or 18 for much of England and Wales. Showers continue rumbling on into the evening, especially in the east. Eventually, a clearer slot of weather moves west to east across the country, temperatures falling away as that happens. But by the morning on Wednesday, well, once again, we'll see cloud and outbreaks of rain moving into the north and the west, winds picking up as well. So double figures to start things off on Wednesday in the west, single figures further east. A bright start for eastern England. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud, outbreaks of rain for Scotland, northern and western England, Wales and Northern Ireland, turning to showers later on. And Thursday brings with it more wind, more rain and showers before more settled weather on Friday. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, two football fans have been charged following an incident at the Etihad Football Stadium after Manchester City's dramatic Premier League win yesterday. As the final whistle marked the club's fourth title in five seasons, thousands of City fans poured onto the pitch. As you saw from those pictures, apologies if you were on the radio, destroying goalposts, but you can imagine it, can't you, as well as throwing blue flares. Greater Manchester Police also investigating the alleged assault of villa keeper Robin Olsen. And this follows other recent pitch invasion incidents, including a fan who was jailed for headbutting Sheffield United's Billy Sharp following their game against Nottingham Forest. Well, joining us now, the sports broadcaster, Ada McGee, uh, to ponder on this one. Aidan, we're asking the question, are we back in the 1980s? That's not your view, is it? No, I mean, you mentioned flares a moment ago. That puts us back in the 70s, possibly, doesn't it? Yeah. But, um, no, 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 I, <laughs> no, I, I, I wow. don't think so. I don't think so. It's, um, you have to remember the period of the season we're in. It's where everything's decided. Tensions are extremely high. You know, even the clubs themselves, the amount of, it's life-changing getting relegated now, even with parachute money. So there's so much riding on everything that's going on. You didn't get this in January, you didn't get this in September. So it's bloodletting in some ways. You know, even Manchester City yesterday, look at the situation those fans were placed in. 15 minutes ago, they're staring down the barrel, the biggest choke, one of the biggest chokes in sporting history, that. It plays it, given the chance to win the league with Villa at home in 14th. And they, You're sounding like an apologist, Aidan. I'm, I'm not sounding an apologist at all. I just think it, we have to consider its exuberance. And I think that those fans went through a lot yesterday. And they went on the pitch. Most of them were not intending to cause trouble. Yeah. Manchester City had it fenced off with um, a ring, or a square of steel. Yes, there was one idiot who made Robin Olsen's life uncomfortable, but it, 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 in totality, it was, a, it was a joyous occasion, as it was at Everton the other night as well. And again, one idiot, two idiots attacked Patrick Vieira. <coughs> Vieira kicked back. I'm glad there's been no action taken against him because that's a really scary situation to be in when you're around a load of strangers who basically want your blood. And, well, a handful anyway, and it only takes a handful, Colin. But we're not going back to the 80s. No, that was different. That was organised crime. That was groups of, uh, of people attaching themselves to, to football clubs and causing trouble using using mobile phones, using the transport network, the London Underground, etc, etc. Michael Portillo. <laughs> well, uh, we have seen photographs, apologies again to radio listeners, and the faces are perfectly clear. I think every one of those people in those photos today should be, uh, there, there should be contact from the club saying, you are no longer welcome. You have broken the law, you've come on the pitch, and you're not welcome back. Because otherwise... No, no defence? I got sucked into this, the exuberance and the... No, in my view, not. No, I mean, look, I think... Banning orders are very difficult to impose. I mean, they're, they're, they're a big stick in the cupboard, and when they come out, everyone thinks, wow, that's, that's real punishment. But really, it's difficult to stop five years down the line somebody else getting into a stadium. I mean, unless the turnstile operator has got a picture of every single person who's banned, then it's very difficult to enforce. And that's what, privately, that's what football clubs will say to you. But it sounds like a tough punishment. But if you look at the situation now compared to 30 years ago, it couldn't be more different. And that, that culture has eased off now for various different reasons. And I think by the start of next season, and I think the, the FA are holding back, and so that the Premier League, they're holding back the major punishments, like the points deductions, like the fines, you know, like the, the, the banning orders. And with CCTV and telephone and, and mobile phone footage now, it's easier to be identified. You'd be really stupid to attempt this on a, on a sort of a large scale. Having said that, I do think drugs are feeding into this in a way that, that perhaps um, it wasn't in the, in the 70s and 80s. So I this, do is, think this is co coked I've up seen, footage. I've seen cocaine uh, uh, use, used at football matches. I've, there was a, there's a ground in London where you know you're going you're to smell something in the air. There's que I've, seen it in fo I've seen it in corporate areas, queues outside toilets. You know, we all know what's going on. It's not, you know, it's, not, um, it's not a secret to people there and people turn a blind eye. You've got to have some kind of, some kind of um, sniffer dogs or something at the door. So wow. even at the corporate areas, you've got to have that. It's not, it wasn't un uncommon. It wasn't, it's not uncommon to be frisked when you go to football. So why not have sniffer dogs to sniff out the, the cocaine? That's the only way to get around it, because I do, it's feeding into it, and the government even said something last week about it. Just on the, on the point of, of pitch invasions, 
Uh, will there be some clubs saying that we can't afford a massive new steward, stewards bill for umpteen more stewards, but we will put some fences up? I mean, and that would be a, a backward step. You'll, you'll, you'll never see, you'll, we'll never see fences again. I mean, right. uh, but the thing about Hillsborough, and it's a great misnomer, is that fences were played a massive part in the in, in the in preventing people from evacuating and stop people getting on the pitch. Yeah. So that's why they're torn down the next day. Years later, it's all blamed on other stuff. The fences never get a mention, but the fences won't be coming back. I grew up at QPR. We never had fences, and so not everywhere had fences, but you'll never see them again. They cause so many, so many problems, Colin. There were, that, that Hillsborough disaster could have happened at two or three different locations within five years leading up to when it actually really, really happened mm -hmm. in, a big, in a big way. So fences, absolutely not. The stewarding bill, that's not a problem for top clubs. These play, Sheffield United finished bottom of the league last season uh, on 26 points. They, got, they walk away with £125 million. Pounds. So, so stewarding is not going to be an issue. When you're talking about Port Vale, Swindon, clubs like that, that's, or even non-league, because it, you have to remember, football hooliganism, as we understand it in the 80s, as we knew it in the 80s, it did, uh, it did flicker in non-league maybe 15 years ago because the shooting wasn't there yeah. and the police weren't there and they could just walk, wander around the stadium as, as they liked. But they're the ones who were, had to foot the bill for the shooting and the policing. Aidan, appreciate you coming in. Sorry it took me so long to get the joke about the flares. <laughs> coming up, we're going to be debating the Rwanda plan. Is it working? There are reports that some asylum seekers are abandoning their attempts to stay in the UK because they're afraid they might be sent to Rwanda. We'll bring you more on that very shortly. First, Tamsin has the news headlines. Colin, thank you. It's 5.33. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. New images of the Prime Minister have emerged, appearing to show him at a party in Downing Street during the second lockdown. In the pictures obtained by ITV News, Boris Johnson is seen raising a glass in a room with a number of other people. According to the broadcaster, the image was taken on the 13th of November 2020, just days after lockdown was imposed. Meanwhile, Downing Street has confirmed the meeting between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray during her investigation was first suggested by Number 10. Officials say Boris Johnson discussed the timings and publication process of her findings into lockdown breaches. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says the meeting was an attempt to undermine the report. In other news, speaking today about the cost of living crisis, the Prime Minister says he's not in favour of introducing new taxes. But as pressure grows to introduce a windfall tax on oil and gas companies, Boris Johnson says no option is... I'm not attracted uh, intrinsically uh, to new taxes, but as I've said throughout, we've got to do what we can, and we will, to look after people through the aftershocks of of COVID, uh, through the current uh, pressures on energy prices that we're seeing uh, post-COVID and with what's going on in, in Russia. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says the world faces a turning point since Russia's invasion of his country. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, Ukraine's leader is urging countries to increase pressure on Moscow. He says all foreign businesses must leave the Russian market so they're not associated with what he called war crimes. The number of confirmed cases of monkeypox in England has now risen to 56, health officials have confirmed. One case has also been recorded in Scotland. It's after the World Health Organisation says there's no evidence the monkeypox virus has mutated, but it expects to find more cases in countries where it's not typically found. The government is advising people who are at high risk of catching the disease to isolate for 21 days. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Colin will be back in just a moment. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound is 1.257 to the dollar and the pound is 1.179 to the euro. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,471.98 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before.
So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot. 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Top stories this afternoon for you. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson says it's important we keep an eye on monkeypox after 57 people have now been diagnosed with the virus here in the UK. The UK Health Security Agency advising anyone at the highest risk of having caught it to, I'm afraid we're going to use that word again, isolate for 21 days. New images of the PM have emerged, appearing to show him at a party in Downing Street during the second lockdown. They've been obtained by ITV News. Mr Johnson seen raising a glass in a room with a number of other people. According to ITV, the image was taken on the 13th of November 2020. And a report into children's social care in England uh, suggests tens of thousands more kids could end up in care unless things uh, start to change. Uh, the review is calling for more than £2 billion of funding to change things for the better. Time for our debate. This hour reports today suggest up to 10 migrants who cross the English Channel have now asked to be returned home rather than risk having their asylum applications processed in Rwanda. So we're asking, is the government's Rwanda migrant plan uh, working? We're joined by Stephen Wolfe, director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, the think tank, and the journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler, a regular contributor here. Gentlemen, welcome to you both, and thanks for your time. Uh, Sam, we'll start with you if we can. Uh, this was in, I think it was in the Mail on Sunday, wasn't it, uh, yesterday, with this line that emerged. Uh, how, mu how much credence do you give it? And, uh, you know, could you, as they did, extrapolate from it a headline saying, the policy's working? Well, I mean, obviously, you can see the numbers the same as I can. Up to 10 isn't obviously very much. Um, you know, you are, with, with a policy like this, which is you know, quite controversial, and a lot of people saw it as um, passing the buck, so to speak, it's expensive at 140 million. But also, um, if you look at the numbers again, they were only expecting to um, send about 300 people to Rwanda out of about 9,000 we've already had this year. So it's um, to have up to 10 people say, oh, no, they'd rather go back. I mean, you don't, we don't know these people's, um, you know, what their scenario is, how they came in, etc. So I don't know. I think it's pretty flimsy to um, say maybe seven people don't want, don't want to go to Rwanda. So therefore, it's, it's a great idea. Wolf, I mean, people will obviously uh, mock the numbers, but the number that we will never know and can never know is how many people, say, in northern France or further afield, will look at stories like this online on their smartphones. They all have very often have smartphones and say, actually, maybe that trip to the UK isn't worth the candle. I, I think, to be honest, we may never know those numbers, but I would say initially, as I've always said so far, that those who are determined to get to the United Kingdom will not at the moment see this as a great threat. 
the threat for them is when they see those going on the planes back to Rwanda in large numbers. And I put freedom of information requests, I've had discussions with the Home Office about this, and they recognise that there is an imperative for them to prove to people that this policy is working beyond those uh, who are the 10 that are seeking to come. And just as an aside here, Colin, this requesting people to return is actually a regular thing. This happens anyway. It happens in those in prisons. It happens to those who've come over in different ways. So this isn't unusual. What's really important for the Home Office in their mind is to show that this works and it will only work once they defeat the immigration industry in the court cases to come. Yeah, and Stephen, just on that point, are, are you expecting, we had a, a plane earlier last week deporting, I think, foreign criminals, and again, 11th hour legal challenges mounted, and I forget the numbers, but, you know, 50 due to be on the plane ended up being less than a dozen. Are you expecting something similar to, to happen with Rwanda? Oh, absolutely. I mean, numbers came out from Migration Watch, which we were following, that shows that £7.2 million have been given to organisations that are actively fighting the Home Office policy. Uh, I've, I've done research that is showing that up to a £250 million over the last five years has been given to organisations that are actively pursuing actions against the government to prevent people from leaving. So these challenges are real. But the government, through the Home Office, released last week a very clear uh, picture and document that sets out reasons why they believe it will fail in the courts. And they're pretty reasonable and strongly argued cases. But you know, uh, and we all know, how slowly it takes to get these cases through the courts. And that's the big challenge at the moment. And meantime, Sam Dowler, we've got the number of people trying to cross the channel tripling pretty much every year. Some people say, well, OK, this that reminds, of, uh, reminds us of how we've got to work on a bilateral process with, with the French. But if the French don't play ball, we don't have very many options left in terms of deterring people. Well, this is the thing. I mean, with obviously the um, with the Rwanda thing, it's just, it's just I mean, when was it even said that it was a ter deterrent? Because when it first started, it was like, oh, look, Rwanda's a lovely country. Um, you know, you've got these beautiful bungalows, which you just heard this week, um, you know, in swimming pools, etc. So why it suddenly become a deterrent as in like, you know, you don't want to go there. I mean, which which is it? I mean, it's, it's we're getting mixed messages from the government, I think, on this one. And as I said before, with the tiny numbers that they're even expecting to be to send there 300 per year. I mean, how does that, like you said, when there's, when there's tripling in numbers of people coming over, what even difference is that going to make particularly? Sam Dowler, Stephen Wool, thanks both very much indeed for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, Michael Portillo was listening on that. Michael, your thoughts? And you've been joined by uh, Peter Whittle, more of whom later. Hi, Peter. Uh, Michael. I think the Rwanda policy would work if it were ever possible to implement it. And the reason I think it would work is that it has worked in Australia. And, and the reason that it works, if it does work, is because it is a deterrent. Uh, Sam Dowler was being a bit amusing there. The reason it works is people want to come to the United Kingdom, not Rwanda. And as soon as they see people being sent to Rwanda, then the migration across the channel eagle, illegally, the, the risk of being drowned in the channel, the money that's going to the people traffickers, all of that will come to an end, all that criminality. But there is a big question as to whether the government will get it through Parliament, through the House of Lords and through the courts. OK, it's a story we'll obviously come back to and regularly, uh, sad to say. Now, a patriotic display of Union flags on Regent Street in London for the Platinum Jubilee has been likened by some on social media to Nazi Germany. The display of red, white and blue along the capital's main shopping route was compared to uh, something from Hitler's Germany. But do people in central London shopping today agree? Uh, we asked some. What the Jubilee stands for is a really lovely occasion um, and I think it's important to recognise the Queen's reign and how long she's been doing this for and what she's done for the country. There's always people that will criticise, especially online. Oh, it looks nice. What else do you want to put there? Some people online, they're comparing it to Nazi Germany in Berlin, hanging swastikas. Rubbish. Load of rubbish. That might be a little extreme. No, I think that's appalling. No, I wouldn't say that. I think it's the Jubilee coming up. It's nice. That's just patriotism. It's been the British flag for oh, years yes. and years. It's... Uh, Peter Whittle is director of the New Culture Forum. Here he is. Uh, Peter, a little bit of me always dies when I say uh, some are saying on social media. <laughs> <laughs> but what did uh, you make of it? Well, Twitter obviously isn't uh, Britain, as David Cameron famously said. Um, 
This happens really usually at the run-up to most big royal occasions. You know, that there's always people, naysayers or people who attack. They've been particularly so this time. I mean, on, on social media, as you say. I mean, frankly, it does make me sick, actually. I mean, I, I'm get, I get sick of the kind of Britain haters uh, who vent. Um, it's become now part of the culture in a way which it maybe wasn't so much before. Um, it's historically illiterate, of course. Everyone knows that, but even the fact that they're complaining about it, um, often, not always, but a lot of these people were quite happy to sort of literally paint their faces in the logo of the EU, you know, the corporate logo of the EU, and walk along with various flags. So they don't mind flags, they just mind this flag. Um, and I think it's very, very insulting too, actually, to the thousands of people who actually are just starting, you know, getting organised with street parties and things like that, totally unbid. No one's forced them to do it. And I think this time at the, at the Platinum Jubilee, this time, um, something like the, the last estimate was about 130,000 street parties, possibly. Now, that's hugely up on 10 years ago. Now, are all those people Nazis? Of course they're not. You know, it's, it's insulting. Uh, it kind of like I've had enough with these people now. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, Michael Portillo, it's a free country. If people want to go on social media and make burks of themselves, that's their <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, but let's be clear. The, um, the swastika is the flag of the Holocaust, mm. of invasion, of mass murder, of dictatorship. The union flag is the flag of liberalism, of democracy, of accountability, of the rule of law. And the European flag is the flag of an elite that was unaccountable. Mm. Wow. Okay. Exactly. I, I mean, uh, uh, that's absolutely all true. I think what, though, it does show is something that this country has got to deal with at some point. When I say deal with it, mm. and that is that the idea of liking your country, patriotism as opposed to sort of nationalism, um, that is sort of dying out simply because it's no longer conveyed in schools, for example. Um, the only thing that slightly worries me is that there is a, a slight... Um, interchange between people on social media and people who are in positions to an extent of power. You know, if, if you like, the intelligentsia, for want of a better word, teachers, people in civil service. And they tend to be far more sceptical about Britain. I mean, that's a nice way of putting it. They mm. tend to be very negative about displays of patriotism. We've got to have symbols that we coalesce about. Absolutely, around, we? we have. And I think that, actually, I think a monarch is a brilliant one, you know, yeah. impartial, a brilliant one. And, what a wonderful thing to celebrate. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Peter? Oh, you, the, uh, I was just going to say, the, the young man who was the first in the interview package there, so lovely to see him saying, we've got to celebrate the Queen. Marvellous. Yes, yes. OK. Peter, thanks for coming in. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Peter Whittle there. Uh, now, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is leading to a shortage of, of some foods, uh, wheat being the most obvious one, and there is a, a long-standing now hike in the price of food in our supermarket shelves. Uh, concern over the UK's food self-sufficiency. This is something uh, we've been banging on about on this news channel for months uh, now. The UK's food self-sufficiency. Bear in mind we only grow, produce about half of the food that we consume in this country. And if the pandemic taught us anything, did it not teach us something about the fragility of supply Chains. Well, the government will this week introduce a bill that will allow farms to grow more crops which have been edited to be more resistant to disease or need less water or fertiliser. Uh, the agricultural journalist Bruce Jobson joins us now to ponder on this one. Uh, Bruce, welcome to you. Uh, gene editing, um, for some people, like the Prince of Wales, for instance, it will conjure up uh, you know, Frankenstein images of uh, people tampering with nature and we don't know where it ends. But actually, the idea of splicing together genes has been done for centuries in plant life. Well, absolutely correct. Thanks for the invitation, Colin. Uh, yeah, it's been done naturally. Um, you, I know you were out in Afghanistan, for example, and 1,100 years ago, uh, there was a thing which was called a carrot, and it was white. And uh, there was a gene mutation that happened, and it turned to yellow. And from the yellow, in about 1,700, the Dutch, which where, where we associate carrots with, uh, developed that further to orange. Now, if somebody did that today in a laboratory, say, at Reading University, I'm sure there'd be outrage. But this is nothing new. But in your lead in there, you, you said it so correctly. You know, um, 
we need to get more uh, disease resistant plants. We need to get them to be able to survive better within drought situations. People are forgetting we've had a lot happening in the past two years. But what has really happened in, in, in the form of agricultural farming is that we will still need to feed roughly 9 billion people by 2050. We've been focusing on other things, and this is a massive thing when already there's 1 billion people undernourished on the planet. And, and this is going to have a huge effect, and we need to use every available tool to do it. Now, just to point out, there's about... On the tools available to us, I mean, does that mean that it's, a, it's, it's folly for, for the British government to be encouraging farmers and paying farmers uh, to say, OK, we're going to plant some trees, uh, or sometimes saying to a big airline that you can offset your carbon, we'll, we'll plant the trees for you, you can worry about the environment a little less, but that means that field which used to produce food is now growing trees. Colin, I'm delighted you've said that. I had articles that were refused to be published because I raised this very point. I got told this doesn't fit the agenda. Oh, no, we can't print that, Bruce. No, absolutely not. Greta wouldn't approve of that. No, the problem is, I'll go back and I'll just point out that uh, this was introduced, zero carbon was introduced through Theresa May in the dying days of her administration. And actually, Mr. Hammond, who I was not a big fan of, uh, he, he actually said, warn, this is going to cost a trillion pound, 44% of GDP. So this went on. And what it will require is that 20% of productive cropland in the UK will be taken out for tree planting. Now, it's absolutely insane when the whole of the UK and the whole of the world is desperate for food. 20% of our... Now, you mentioned, and I've mentioned on this channel several times, we're down to 50 55% self-sufficiency. If you take another 20% out and start planting yeah. little twiglets, you're not going to get, you know, uh, uh, food security. I've yeah. been writing about this in 2011. Well, uh, Bruce, I think we're good. out of time, but you, you, we'll invite you on to keep on talking about it because it's, it's about as vital an issue as it's possible to imagine. Bruce Jobson, uh, there. Michael Portillo has been our guest throughout the course of uh, the last afternoon. My, my gaze was drawn to your trousers when he talked about the carrot being yellow, <laughs> yeah. much as orange as your trousers. Did they ever, were they ever white? Uh, oh, of course they were, there, but <laughs> back in the 17th century. Um, uh, I really enjoy being on this channel, by the way, but... Uh, I've been struck by the way that the government is seizing opportunities. I mentioned earlier how we're now talking about developing oil and gas fields, which a few months ago was verboten, but in the situation of the, of the shortage of energy, we're looking at that. And we've been talking about gene edited crops for years, and now we're going to get them. The camera operator was fe feverishly trying to get a reframe for a picture of your trousers. We couldn't quite make it out. Oh, no, hang on. Uh, there hang they on. are. <laughs> Not something you see every day, is it? Here's Michelle Juby to talk about what's coming up on her show. Michelle. Well, I've got the uh, privilege of being able to see Michael's trousers. They are indeed very dapper. Coming up on my show tonight, uh, one of my panellists, Calvin Robinson, joins me for the first time tonight. He's had his kind of... Uh, he's desperate, some might say, to become a priest, but he's had it blocked by the Church of England. Apparently his views are too conservative. He says that the church isn't institutionally racist, they say it is. Uh, we'll be looking at all that and asking as well, why are so many people in this country seemingly desperate to call pretty much the entire thing racist? And care leavers, do you think it should be a protected characteristic? Some do. And the Queen's Jubilee, will he be out partying? Get this, some councils have been giving grants of up to a thousand thousand pounds. Is that really what taxpayers' money should be going on? Us lot getting drunk and having a good old knees up. So we'll have that and more, Colin. Michelle, thanks very much indeed. A couple of emails on Rishi Sunak. Does it matter that he's so wealthy? Does it in any way impinge on his ability to do his job as Chancellor? Barbara says, there's a lot of irrational wealth envy about just because a person has been able to become extremely wealthy, especially not from the public purse, doesn't mean they can't understand the plight of people who haven't had the personal ability to make a lot of dosh for one reason or another. However, Pamela says, I think it does matter that Rishi Sunak and his wife are on the rich list. He knew how to avoid paying tax. I think I ought to include brackets allegedly, on their fortune. Plus, he's too rich to understand how difficult his decisions have made life for pensioners like myself, says Pamela. We're back tomorrow with all the news for you. Coming up next, Michelle Jubry. Do stand by.
Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's certainly been a showery start to the week for many of us. Some sharp downpours out there, more prolonged rain in some places, but there'll also be a few clear spells coming along overnight. Now, the more prolonged rain at the moment caused by a weather front that's close to the southeast, that does push away, but to further showers or longer spells of rain are moving in from the west and northwest. And so that's during the evening, much of the UK seeing some heavy rain at times, a fairly lively rash of showers crossing central and southern parts of the country, while some more persistent rain affects the far northeast of Scotland. Scattered showers continuing for Western Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, but some clear spells in between for parts of the north and the west, and temperatures falling into the single figures, perhaps even the mid to low single figures in some sheltered northern parts. So a bright but chilly start to the day on Tuesday for many of us. Showers very quickly get going from the word go. Again, some heavy downpours out there, even some hail and thunder in the south. But away from the showers, some sunshine, particularly in the west, later in the afternoon into the evening. And temperatures around average for the time of year. So 15, 16 Celsius for Scotland, Northern Ireland, 17 or 18 for much of England and Wales. Showers continue rumbling on into the evening, especially in the east. Eventually, a clearer slot of weather moves west to east across the country, temperatures falling away as that happens. But by the morning on Wednesday, well, once again, we'll see cloud and outbreaks of rain moving into the north and the west, winds picking up as well. So double figures to start things off on Wednesday in the west, single figures further east. A bright start for eastern England. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud, outbreaks of rain for Scotland, northern and western England, Wales and Northern Ireland, turning to showers later on. And Thursday brings with it more wind, more rain and showers before more settled weather on Friday. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, it's six o'clock, I'm Michelle Jubery and this is Jubes & Co, the show where we'll get into some of the things that have got you talking today. Now, one of my panel members, a new panel member, has been on this channel lots, but not on this show, Calvin Robinson. He has been blocked from becoming a vicar by the Church of England. Why? Well, apparently because he's got conservative views and also, get this, the audacity to question whether indeed the church really is institutionally racist, as many claim. So I ponder, is the Church of England a little bit too work? And why are so many people seemingly desperate to call so much of this country racist? 
And apparently growing up in care should be a protected characteristic in equality law, should it be? And the Queen's Jubilee is around the corner. Will you be out celebrating? Many councils have been granting, uh, giving you grants, should I say, to get your party started. Some of them up to a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds to get drunk and celebrate the Queen? Is this really how they should be spending our money? All that to come tonight, but first, the latest news headlines.